My name is Philip Martin, and I'm the uh, co-owner of Philip Martin Gallery with my wife, Portia Hine, and hopefully you've had a chance to uh, meet us at the fairs or stop by the gallery. I'm incredibly excited to be talking with Sky Glabish today. Um, working with Sky has just been such a great pleasure, and the show that's on at the gallery is really, really fantastic. Um, so we have a lot of uh, things to kind of get through today. Um, so yeah, I guess it, I guess let's go ahead and get started. Um, so Sky, uh, the show is called Weight of Light, and uh, maybe we want to get get started there. What do you think? Sure. Yeah. Well, that that's the title of the piece, um, which is uh, an image of a kind of the sun reflected on water. Mm -hmm. And um, when I was making the painting, I was kind of uh, reacting to something that had emerged from the last exhibition that I did with you mm -hmm. um, called The Caged Lark. And in that show, um, uh, I had been sort of grappling with this, with this idea of trying to make a painting of the sun and then having spent a bit of time in Norway and also being a big fan of Edvard Munch, I was really aware of that, the painting that he had done of the sun and I didn't know, I didn't really have a good access point into that. Um, so I just sort of went into it thinking about his painting, but then when that show was finished, I, I felt like there was still a lot of, um, there were still ideas or there were still things about the sun that that I I wanted to explore. Um, and there was another painting in that show called The Black Sea, which was a very similar format to this painting that you're talking talking about the weight of light. Uh, you're in that it's just about sort of, this painting here, obviously. Uh, sorry? I just said for our listeners at home, you were talking about this painting right here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And in the last show, the the um, the Black Sea was it had a very similar format, just divided right down the middle, uh, and then there were kind of like these diamond shapes in the in the sea part. So I thought of kind of revisiting both the sun painting from the last show and the sea painting from the last show, and kind of thinking about those things again. <clears throat> but as I I started working on it, the um, the surface or the the kind of area in the in the top part of the painting, the kind of sun and the and the radi the radius. Uh, um, became really physical and, and, and kind of uh, almost like you were looking at the rings of a tree trunk or, mm -hmm. or like a meteor uh, exploding or just it, it was very physical and so I thought there was this kind of interesting um, play between something very ephemeral and fleeting and, and light and just like this the space the air mm -hmm. uh, around the sun and the, and then also this really concrete kind of you know quite physical and almost visceral kind of surface so the the the, the poem uh, that I, I was quoting from the Walt Whitman poem had this beautiful passage called the weight of uh, says, a vision prophetic staggered with the weight of light and I just thought that made a nice and my, it was a nice title for the for the painting yeah um and then what about the play between the weight of light um, and then this work here? Because in a sense, they kind of developed one in, in relationship to one another. Yeah, they, they definitely did. I did that one first. Um, originally, you know, we, we were talking about, I, I began this show right after, or sorry, this painting right after the last show, thinking about some future projects with you. And then... Um, so I had this painting in the studio since about last uh, May or, or so, June. And, um, and with this painting, uh, I was also kind of thinking about the night sky, but trying to, um, I mean, sometimes I, I'll see paintings of the sky where the stars look sort of twinkly. Oop, I'm raising my hand. Um, and I didn't really want to have them looking like little twinkly sort of snowflakes or little glitter or something I wanted them to feel a little bit more like uh, I don't know what the word is but something kind of physical something kind of um, 
uh, painterly. Uh, so I kind of made them thicker and, 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 and grittier almost than, mm -hmm. than you would think about stars. Uh, and it was through a process of, of kind of stripping the paint away, like with turpentine, like cutting down through the darker layer down to the lighter layer underneath. Um, yeah, and so um, in this painting, there, there's a Canadian artist by the name of Patterson Ewan, um, who who's, was from Montreal originally, but, but did a lot of his major works in London, Ontario, where I live. Um, Patterson Ewan is a big, a big uh, influence on me. So I was sort of thinking about his work and I was also thinking about the artist Ross Blechner and mm -hmm. the kind of elegiac uh, memorial paintings that he had made in the 80s and 90s, uh, which were a huge influence on me when I was a young artist. And so it, again, the, the night skies just became an excuse to sort of play um, in a field of color, in a field of light, uh, sort, of, sort of just letting the brush strokes and the and the process of, of making that painting, let it, let it be really free and kind of open. And, um, and there was no plan, there was no drawing, there was no, there was no uh, set scheme. It was just uh, very fluid and, and organic. And um, so that painting kind of cre created a field, you know, like a kind of an opening. Uh, and then once I had that really dark kind of nighttime painting, I wanted to react to it with that other light, the painting about the sun and just sort of making these poles. So, you know, that's really interesting because we've never talked about, you know, you mentioned Patterson Ewing and we've talked, I, I don't know his work, so I will go and look it up. And we've talked about Edvard Munch, another artist that I was thinking about recently was Harold Solberg. I have a book of his work. He's a Norwegian painter, a peer of Monk, who just had an, actually by coincidence that I was looking at the book and that he just had an amazing result at, Sub, at Sotheby's um, in terms of, I think, people um, getting to know him. But Ross Bleckner is an interesting person to talk about. You know, when you mention it, you know, that completely makes sense. What Talk a little bit just about why why Ross Bleckner was interesting to you. Was it kind of how he structures paintings? No, I mean, maybe, but it, I, I just like the poetic, kind of elegiac, super romantic, mm -hmm. you know, they were full of feeling, they were full of, they were full of a uh, sense of loss, but also a sense of memorializing. They were done at the height of the AIDS crisis. So there was a lot of, there was this sort of, um, uh, you know, paintings of little birds or, or, or flashes of light or trophies or urns. It was all about kind of like memorializing something. And, uh, but the thing that I liked about those paintings, he was using wax and he would, he would, you know, he would put, he, I don't know if he still does, but he would put wax down and then cover the wax with something like, like oil paint and then rub through it. So that they were very luminous and, and, and quite translucent. And so for a long time, I was, you know, I made paintings that look, <laughs> they look quite a bit like Ross Blechner. Um, mm -hmm. And I had forgotten about it. I hadn't really been thinking about it. I hadn't really been, it wasn't in the forefront of mine until I started making this painting. And then, and this is, I was, when I started making this painting, I had just reverted back to like 20 years, 25 years ago when I was a student and, and all of the things that I had done, you know, in the nineties uh, kind of came flooding back to me. But it was interesting because it came flooding back to me in a very uncontrived, very, very intuitive, open way. Like I wasn't looking at any images or anything. It was just a kind of a way of being with the painting sure. that came back to me. And then and it reminded me of my early work, too. But it was freer than my earlier work. It was more right. um, uh, the, the language that I'm using now was just that much more kind of... Um, uh, present in the way I made this one. Um, but yeah, so Ross Blechner, just, just, a, I think what I like about him is he was an artist that, that was given permission somehow, or gave himself permission to deal with questions like, like, uh, you know, life after death or questions about the, the ineffable or questions about the soul. Uh, and, and maybe because he, he was an artist dealing with, with the AIDS crisis, he was given that kind of permission um and i always liked you know i always loved his paintings and and i like that kind of light and the kind of 
the kind of radiance in his work. I, I haven't seen his work that much in the last little while, but I, I'd love, I'd love to sort of maybe do a little bit, you know, look a little bit closer at what yeah. he's been up to lately. Yeah. Well, it's, it's really interesting what you're describing. I mean, that experience of, you know, being in the studio, working on a painting, especially when you've been, I mean, how long have you been making paintings for? Uh, well, I had my first exhibition in 1998. Right. Uh, so, and I'd been painting it for a couple of years, th three or four years before that. I started showing quite early on in my career. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, you've been a professional artist then in, in terms of being visible to the art world since for 25 years. And obviously been making, probably making work for 10 years more than that. So that's like 35 years of making work. I mean, that experience that you mentioned really resonates with me in terms of that feeling of being in the studio, having a moment in front of the painting where you are, you know, so engaged in it in terms of its materiality or your brush stroke, you're really maybe even only a few inches away from it. And something happens that kind of triggers this kind of, as you talk about, I'm, I'm going to call it, it's almost like a time travel of, of these creative moments in your life and how you've interpreted yourself or how you've pulled from sources, how those sources, sources change. Uh, it's not really a question. It's just a, just a reaction, I guess, to, to what, to what you're saying. I think that's really powerful in terms of how, how one experiences, you know, this interaction. Mm -hmm. Well, for me, painting is, is so much about, um, I mean, I have been engaged in a lot of different media over the years, but painting is kind of like my, in some ways I would say it's kind of like my identity in a way, but, um, but, but with painting, at least for me, I don't know how other artists are, but for me, it's always a dialogue. It's always a, I'm always in a, I'm always in some kind of conversation with other, with other artists, right. um, whether they're, you know, whether they're alive or dead or whether, whether it's something um, real or imagined, it's, it's, it's actually a very strong, I'll, it might be the strongest aspect actually of my, of my studio practices, that feeling of a kind of a dialogue with, with other artists and, with other painters and 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 sometimes a, a painter will open up a new way of seeing something and it's like oh wow um you know it's just it, it feels it's it feels so much like a like a dis, like a tr like traveling you know and then, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you're in a new place you're in a new you're in a new territory you're a new land and 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 that new land is is often sort of uh i don't know that that space is often um a space of of kind of a conversation or, or an opening with another artist all the that's, time that's so i'm just totally fascinated i mean that i can see from what you're saying that it's something that's not by choice in a way it's an unavoidable thing that's going on in your mind has that always been easy for you i mean and you would, i i'm guessing as a younger artist it's it's inspiring but stressful and then as you get more comfortable in your practice like how do you create patience for yourself in terms of the evolution of a vision that is both, you know, something you're directing through your own agency, but also is occurring through the simple interactions of materials and, and such. And, but in, in, in conversation with this great desire to, to interact with, with this incredible legacy of other makers. Well, it's not easy. No, it's um, not. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> like there are times when it's what's kind of euphoric. Yeah. Like there are t there are times when it's really exciting, but mostly it's not. Mostly it's um, it's kind of painful. Usually, <laughs> like there, yeah. There's usually like a there's usually this this kind of euphoria around and I like a new thing or a new possibility. But then as soon as you start working, or as soon as I start working, I usually I, I usually kind of make something that looks bad or, or it just looks like a bad copy of something yeah. or it doesn't look real. It doesn't have life. It, and, and there's, there's this, there's this period that 
I think a lot of people are afraid of, like they get, they get, they get afraid in this period, but it's kind of like, you don't yeah. know a way out, but mm -hmm. you're in the middle of something that's not really working. It's not, it's not, it's not going the way you kind of thought it would go. It isn't yielding the results that you thought would be yielded. And you're kind of confused and kind of lost, mm -hmm. <laughs> but then something often there's some little, there's some little doorway or something happens that makes you think, Oh, maybe I can find my way out. And yeah. then, and then sometimes when you do find your way out or, or something happens and, and you do understand the, the direction it is, ex, it can be extremely, uh, get like, sometimes I'll, I'll just be like, you know, tears, I'll, I'll tear right. up when I'm in the studio. Or I just get so overcome with, with a feeling. And I think that the thing that I'm looking for uh, oftentimes is that feeling of like, um, something kind of enters into the room or enters into the space un, uh, you know, kind of not uninvited. Uh, you are inviting it, but un, you, uh, un, you didn't predict it. You didn't see it coming in when it comes. It can be pretty, it can be pretty dramatic. And I want yeah. that kind of drama to be sort of sustained in the painting. It's just such a powerful thing that you're saying. I mean, and it just takes time to allow yourself to have that experience. I mean, I hope that people are understanding that we're not talking about, we're not talking about copying or we're not talking about anything like that. You're, you're, it's, it's really figuring. And I mean, figuring like in the creation of, to, in the form of your identity and your vision and, and such, it's, it's just a very, it's such a powerful thing to say, Sky it really is very reflective for me. And then, and one of the, Things, you know, here we're looking at three more paintings and I have detailed images of each of these. So we'd like to talk about these, these works. I'll follow up with that. But um, I was just gonna say, you know, I was really struck in the piece you wrote for the book that we're coming at, that's, that we're doing. Um, you can order it, pre-order it online if you want to. It's on our publications page. Uh, there's a link to buy it from our Instagram and the bio link. It's $20. It's not a big book, but there's images you won't see. There's studio shots and there's a great conversation with Scott. And you made this point where you're talking about starting a work and that you start it. And then it kind of, it's, I don't remember what the word was you used, but just that it's just not, it, does, it doesn't have the life you know it can have. It doesn't do what you know it can do. And then part of it is sometimes, you know, just, I, I don't remember if you use the word standing down or scraping down, but to get it to start to be a, a real thing with feeling and, and, and meaning. Yeah, well, there's a lot of different kind of strategies that I have for doing, for doing what you just described. Um, and usually, usually it involves like kind of creating the drawing or, or like mapping out the piece and mm -hmm. kind of, if I'm working from a study like that painting right in front of us, it's called, I think I called it hyacinth and night scent. Yeah. Um, but I was working from a little watercolor that I had shown with you previously. Mm -hmm. It was from a show of works on paper that, I, and all of those works on paper were, or have the potential to be turned into, into larger works there. I use the, I use the studies uh, the really, really the most important part of my practice, I think, is is generating these little works on paper because they're the seeds for 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 what the paint what you know for paintings that I can potentially pursue. But anyway, in this case, I I just basically copied the the watercolor as best I could. I kind of got it up there. I looked at it, and uh, and I knew that it just felt you know it just didn't feel like anything. It just it just kind of just was sort of dead. So then. Um, it wasn't even dead. It was, it was preliminary. It was provisional. Yeah. It was open. It was, it was all potential, but it hadn't, there was no realization there. Yeah, great. And so oh, I think in this case, I just, I just covered it in, um, I just wiped it out. Like I just painted over the whole thing in some color and then began to sort of rebuild it. But it wasn't until, so there's this kind of electric blue, uh, like these little sort of organic shapes in the top of the painting. Sure. Th those were, as I was driving home at night, one, one night I was looking along the side of the road and there was these cornfields. And then I just, I thought the cornfields, cornfields were making this really haunting, strange kind of sh form, shape. So I just drew the, that cornfield into the, into the background of that painting. And then when I did that, the whole thing just kind of came alive. It needed some, it needed some kind of polarity. It needed something to kind of react against. So it wasn't until I got to that point, and that was 
weeks and weeks into the painting before I even added that. Um, but when I did that, then I knew that the painting had some kind of uh, dialogue, some kind yeah. of, you know, energy. Well, Doc, I'm going to let the cat out of the bag because uh, Tom Marie and I are going to dodge and I are going to curate a show on night painting because I'm fascinated with night paintings. And I'm going to ask you to participate in it because I love in a night painting how, you know, you, it's in a way this like perfect metaphor for painting itself because you can't be there on site to paint it from life in a sense. I mean, you can't you turn on the light or whatever, but it's always going to be this difference between the painting and reality that you're going to have to interpret it. So, and there's so many mm -hmm. incredible night paintings. And so anyway, that's, that's coming up. <laughs> that sounds like a good show. Dude, I'm obsessed with night paintings. I could talk about it for hours. Yeah. Um, Here's a painting called Hoarfrost. I love this painting. Love the feeling of the drawing. I have some detail shots. Do you want to talk us just sort through this picture and I'll flip some details? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm really happy with this painting. Um, I, I think I've mentioned a, a few times in different interviews and different conversations I've had with people that I had a kind of turning point back in about 2000 and 16 or 17 in a trip to New York. And I spent a lot of I've you know, spent quite a bit of time in New York over the years. And this, this room with the Matisse paintings at the Museum of Modern Art has always been kind of a touchstone for me. I, it's my favorite sort of collection of, of paintings in all of New York. And I, right. I, I take sort of make pilgrimages to it. But yeah. the last time I was there, I was so overcome with looking at this, my, one of my favorite paintings called The Piano Lesson, uh -huh. that I sort of decided to take a turn in my work and, and turn towards that. So this painting here, is very close to a lot of the kind of issues that come out of the, that painting, the, the piano lesson, just in terms of the kind of, uh, you know, the kind of flatness, but also it's, it's a flatness that's really punctuated by a strong kind of graphic, um, you know, kind of strong, bold graphic sensibility. And then the colors in that painting as well are, you know, um, uh, the colors are kind of like muted, but you know, they're strong, but kind of strange. Mm -hmm. it, it almost looks like a painting that was painted into wet concrete. Um, <laughs> so it's, you know, it's kind of very, very physical. Yeah. Uh, uh, it, it, and illusory, like that little, that little detail you have there, there's a tree that you can kind of see right through. It's kind of like a ghost tree. Yeah. Um, so anyway, this painting is quite inspired by, by that painting, The Piano Lesson by Matisse, which is interesting because this is like three or four years into, maybe five years into the, the kind of like the the direction the realignment back towards that kind of painting yeah uh, i can see a lot of the impetus or the intuition i can see it in this painting um I, so anyway that, that's something that that strikes me about this one and then there's also other painters and they're like the the brush stroke you know the kind of using the direction of the brush stroke to kind of create a sense of space that's sort of a van gogh kind yeah. of a move um but but ultimately i think i think it doesn't look like van gogh and it doesn't look like matisse it looks like it, it looks like my work yeah. and uh i'm happy that that i can have that kind of yeah. that kind of feeling towards those ar artists but also create something that just looks like my work and yeah um so that's how i feel about this well, the liberation of line in this piece is really fascinating to me because there was this other painting called Lake in the Forest, which I think, you know, which is a painting that, that we, we worked on in a previous show. It's an incredible painting. It uses some of these aspects um, and it uses line in many of the ways there's lines in this painting in terms of like the blue trunk, for example. But there's also this incredible liber, I mean, saying liberation of line. I don't know why I'm saying that. <laughs> but there's, there's this liberation of line in terms of uh, in this painting as a repetitive repeating element as well as a linear element in terms of not the trees but rather here in the in the in the bush uh, bush area mm -hmm. or other areas in the field mm -hmm. so. yeah well i mean i think that's one of the big issues with painting is what's the relationship between color and line yeah you know like like how does color um in a sense color creates planes um and also uh, painting is sort of a delineation uh mm -hmm of color using using line and so in that in that one there's that dialogue between the color and the kind of linearity the line the graphic quality there's i think there's an interesting um 
there's some interesting questions that kind of open up. Yeah, this is another beautiful, beautiful painting, uh, similar scale um, from that shot. Just, a, just a gorgeous work. Do you want to talk about this painting, Young Poet? Yeah, I mean, we talked a little bit about it at one point because I said I spent more time on that painting than on all the other ones. Sure. Um, I, I probably worked on it for two months, which is crazy. It's, maybe it's a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I just kept going back to it and going back to it and going back to it. And, and, and I guess in the, in the end, what I was looking for, which I achieved, which I think was achieved, um, was a kind of pure visceral almost like broken glass or tile like a surface that's just um that is just uh, a surface that is geometry and line and kind of aggressive and ex painterly but painterly in a very kind of just very physical way kind of like using little facets and plant like 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 a, a matrix of facets faceted lines so that was the that's the structure but then the portrait itself really looks like somebody it looks like an expression it looks like a person the the personality emerged of mm -hmm. i don't i don't know if it, it, what the gender is mm -hmm. i don't really know what the age is or i might not even really know what it's sort of cultural you know some people have said it looks egyptian and i think that might just be the hairdo <laughs> because I wasn't really thinking about Egyptian painting, but it is interesting that it has this kind of like um, Cleopatra-like hairdo. Yeah. But um, anyway, the, the painting for me is, is, a, is, a, is a conversation between pure kind of physical gestural expression and personality. And when right. the two things can go together at the same time, I feel like you're really, you're onto something. And in a sense, you know, of course, you do not paint these from a particular person, neither life nor a photograph. And so these paintings, in terms of the people that arrive in similar sense to the landscape, they do they do you uh, you're, you're seemingly suggesting that you learn about them in a sense as you make the work. Yeah, like I'm waiting for the I'm waiting for the personality or the I'm waiting for the figure to emerge that looks mm -hmm. real. Yeah. And what I mean by real is I, I, I almost mean that literally, like it actually looks like a, like maybe like a person, yeah. um, but it doesn't look like a person that you would see kind of walking up to you on the street, maybe. Um, mm -hmm. Although maybe it does actually, because because there's something about the uh, the expression that for, is very familiar to me. But anyway, um, do you ever put the I, people in a landscape or in a. Well, I want to. I mean, I think that's the that's the great challenge really is to. Is to have them. The, the the reason that I haven't done it, I I often do it, but they usually kind of get burned away as the yeah. painting is 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 going on because I don't I don't always know where I'm going, and so I often tend to sort of wipe out stuff. But yeah. that is the putting the figure in the landscape um, is sort of the ultimate challenge in in a lot of ways. Yeah. Well, you know, we've got about two more minutes here. This has been a great conversation um there's so many more things to talk about of course um you know it, the show has been fantastic and um again i'm going to remind people about the the little publication that we did you should go get that you're going to find a lot of interesting things that you won't have seen elsewhere and our show is up through december 23rd and uh, I'm going to do a conversation with Lori Nye next Wednesday, uh, same time, 9 a.m. Uh, uh, Pacific. Um, Sky, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you, you want to say before we get going? Uh, no, just, just like the last conversation, you know, I'm really, I'm really appreciative of the chance to show my work uh, um, in Los Angeles. I, it's interesting for me to again to sort of see things from a distance there's a number of painters that 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 i know in in la that are have written to me or, or you know contacted me in one way or the other and kind of a conversation with with people like Lori that is really valuable to me so i'm i'm really happy that um 
that some of these artists, some of these painters that I'm talking to can see the work in real life because I, yeah. I think it just doesn't, my, my work especially just doesn't photograph well. Yeah. And uh, I think the experience of seeing it in, in person is, is, is um, that's really the only way to see these works, I think. Yeah. So if, you're, if you are in LA, um, you know, I think it's, uh, it's been nice for me to have had this conversation with people and then people have gone to, to see the work and sort of yeah. talk to me a little bit about it. So I'm just very grateful for, for that and for the chance to, to work with the gallery and uh, the, with some of the clients that you're working with too. There's been a lot of support for, for my work since I started showing with you and uh, you know, it's just really good. I'm happy. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity. I mean, I think it is, it's really amazing. I think, you know, people are not inside a gallery. They don't, you know, know. I mean, I think that's one of the things that COVID made so clear to me was how the artists that I work with, my clients, the people that come in, the people that write to me. I mean, even, you know, I get DM'd by MFA students on Instagram and they're like, I love this, this work. I love this. It's, it's that chance to participate in the community and, and have that conversation is so powerful. And so people are, well, you know, you're welcome to come. We have regular gallery hours now. We're open 10 to four, Tuesday through Saturday, or you can make an appointment. Um, thank you so much, Guy, for, for doing this show with me and the uh, conversation and look forward to our next, our next chat. All right, thanks, Philip. See you around.